So today we're going to talk about the sense and sense of a healthy lifestyle. Hippocrates in the 5th century before Christ, we knew that they knew that, they had the sense that there was a relationship between exercise and health. It was well known. He said, eating alone will not keep a man well. He must also take exercise, for food and exercise work together to produce health. As we move through years of scientific research, we can see that there has been a correlation between physical activity and health status. Some of the early research that was done in London with Morris et al., they were looking at the bus drivers uh, and then the conductors and the people who did the double-decker buses. And the bus driver would drive the bus and the conductor would go up and down the stairs all day long and take tickets. And what they found out was the people who were taking the tickets, if they did have a heart attack, they actually recovered better and their instance of having a heart attack was a lot lower than the poor man who had to drive the bus all day. We also know that the more um, fit you are, you tend to live longer, you have a healthier life, and so there has been that association between physical activity and health. And it, but it also comes across all subsets in some relationship. For instance, we know that regardless of your age, regardless of your sex, your race, or the environment, there is still a relationship between physical and activity. Still talking about the sense of physical activity, the benefits. Well, we all know, of course, that we have disease prevention, injury prevention, increased energy, healthy weight, um, and good mental health. But I really want to talk about the disease prevention one. And that number one is that we know that if you live a healthy lifestyle, for instance, your chance of getting diabetes is cut by 50% if you are prone to having diabetes, if you would exercise, that really can help a lot. And also if you have hypertension, it lowers um, your blood pressure without drugs if you do exercise. If you um, lead a healthy lifestyle, you can lower your risk for colon cancer by 60%. And kind of close to my heart, because my mother does have Alzheimer's, if you do exercise, you can lower your chance of developing Alzheimer's by 40%. So um, all of those things are so positive. So disease prevention is really, I think, the key to living a healthy lifestyle. There are three major factors that influence our health and longevity. And they are genetics, environment, and behavior. Of those three, you can see that health behavior is 50%. It's more important than your environment. It's more important than genetics. So once again, we're reiterating how important it is to lead a healthy lifestyle. Healthy or unhealthy behaviors impact an individual's health more than anything else. And so that also takes into account physical activity, nutrition, and then your use of tobacco, alcohol, slice drugs, and of course, if you can manage your stress. There are a lot of different determinants of physical activity, and up here I have posted a few of them. Um, but the one I really want to talk a lot about is past physical activity. I was a physical education teacher for several years before I got into higher education. And how many people in here were some type of athlete? Raise your hand. And how many of you, if you did not do what you were supposed to, you were punished by being made to run? Same way with physical education classes. We tended to say to students, oh, if you're not going to do this, then you need to drop down and do push-ups or you need to go and run. And what happened by doing that past physical activity, some, if it was in a negative, then it also gave that message to those people subconsciously that physical activity is bad. I don't want to do it. I didn't like it. It made me feel bad. So I think sometimes past physical activity has really been a negative 
negative um, indicator, especially for um, people who are in my age group. Some more research that's out there. Stanford University um, School of Medicine has been a leader in doing a lot of research concerning um, health, healthy lifestyles. And here are, are, are kind of some results of around 305 uh, studies. There are around 340,000 people that they looked at. And they were really looking at early death in patients who had strokes or heart attacks. And this is such a powerful message. Look at this. Number one, they found in stroke patients, exercise was more effective than drugs in getting those people back. And number two point, patients who had had, had exercise who had had heart attacks, exercise appeared to be as effective as drugs than in preventing early deaths. So once again, you see that whole topic that we're working with is exercise truly is medicine. So without a doubt, exercise is medicine, and it in fact can be seen as the much needed vaccine to prevent chronic disease and illness. I wanted to talk a little bit about lifestyle epigenics. Who has heard of this? Anybody out there? Except for my dear colleague who was talking to me about it two days ago. So, <laughs> so anyway, it's really pretty exciting. Lifestyle epigenics, it can change in your own genetic destiny. This is kind of on the forefront right now. Time Magazine had a little piece about it. Um, and basically, I guess a way to look at it is lifestyle can, can affect your genetic makeup or your genes. Um, for instance, what your grandmother ate for her life and what she, did she smoke for her life, did she um, um, exercise, that actually transfers over to you. So that's something that's really exciting. It's also exciting for our students that are in exercise science. This is gonna open up a whole new field for you to find jobs. So everybody, all students, remember lifestyle epigenetics, especially when you start to look for an internship. You may be seeing some things out there with that. Now, the sense. Everybody in this room, I'm sure it's like speaking to the choir. You all believe in exercise. You either believe in exercise or your, your professor made you come, but you still believe in exercise, right? But the problem is, we know it, but common sense is not necessarily so common, especially when it comes to physical activity. Here's an example of something that I found I thought was pretty cute. The people are taking the, <laughs> the escalator up to work out at their 24-hour fitness. Or have you ever noticed people will drive around and round and round to find the closest parking spot they can to even go into um, to the campus recreation. I see it in Brophy too, even though we're really lucky we have parking lots close to us, I see students drive around so that they can get on the front row instead of going in. Or how many students wait for the bus when they could walk so much quicker to class, but they will wait. So common sense is not so common when it comes to physical activity because we know we need to be active. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now. Would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is it?
I thought that was pretty good. I found that when I did a little search. Anyway, some, uh, some things that still common sense is not so common that we're going to move into are some of those fitness myths that you may have seen or heard out there. Um, exercise is one sure way to lose weight. Well, it helps, but you cannot exercise enough to really lose a lot of weight. For example, if you weigh 150 pounds and you walk for 30 minutes, you burn about 150 calories. It takes 3,500 calories to burn a pound. So you're going to have to walk for 11 and a half hours before you can lose a pound. So I doubt that you really want to do that. However, if you combine it with proper eating and uh, nutrition and diet, so if you cut out of your daily um, diet 500 calories and you do that for seven days, okay, there you've lost a pound too. So then you don't have to, you know, your 11 and a half hours don't look quite as bad as... Uh, as not eating 500 calories a day. So in other words, you've got to do them to get together. Doing crunches or working on an ab machine will get rid of belly fat. Not necessarily. You're strengthening some muscles, but you still not, are not really burning the fat to get rid of. And the other thing is, people, you know, we're all built a certain way. Some of us are bananas, some of us are pears, and some of us are apples. And I'm here to tell you, if you're built like an apple, you can be the best apple you can be, but you will never be a banana. <laughs> so, fitness myth number three. You will burn more fat if you exercise longer at a lower intensity. Well, that's not necessarily true. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Because if you do something at a higher intensity, yes, you burn more calories, and that's really good, and you don't have to go for as long. And we would like to do that. But the problem is, that's the best way to burn calories. But the problem is, you have to be high fit enough to be able to do that. So you have to start slow. You have to spend the time to burn the calories. But you do not burn more fat if you exercise longer at a lower intensity. That's not necessarily true. An aerobic workout will boost your metabolism for hours after you stop working out. That would mean that person who did their 30 minutes of walking, she wouldn't have to do anything else for several days because she could still be burning fat. So we know that, doesn't, that isn't true. You boost it for a while, but not for that long. Muscle weighs more than fat. I hear this all the time, and I see Dr. Saturn down there, and I know I've talked to her about this. A pound is a pound. It weighs the same. Muscle is a little more dense. But as still, we know it doesn't, people will say, oh, I'm going to weigh a lot more because I'm building muscle. No. And fitness myth number six, you are fit if you are thin, you are unfit if you are fat. Now, how many of you have the skinny, skinny mother or grandmother who probably weighs 90 pounds, but when you take a hold of her arm, it's mush. Is she fit? No. She's thin but she's not fit. And are, you are unfit if you are fat. That is not necessarily true. You, things are based on BMIs, which is your body mass index, and you're looking at your height and weight. And sometimes a lot of people will have a lot of muscle mass, and they are fit. In fact, there's research that is showing right now that people who are, um, it's almost healthier to be a little on the fat side and be fit versus being thin and not fit. So it's about being um, fit and being physically active. We're all here, we all know the obesity epidemic in June was turned into what? What did we change that wording to? Exercise science students. Isn't obesity a disease now? So we've gone from it being an epidemic to being termed a disease for the United States. That's fairly a powerful message. And you have probably seen by state, they show the obesity epidemic. And you can see where the different states, how, um, who has the highest um, percentage of obese people. And we see those fairly common. So that's why I put this up. This slide shows adult, percent of adults physically inactive by state. And the reason I put that up is because it mirrors the obesity percentage. So we know that that relationship but between being sedentary and obese is so strong. 
The American College of Sports Medicine recommends 30 minutes of activity every day. This is from a group called Wellcoa, and they state that most 70, most 75% exactly, of Americans do not meet this goal. Exercise 30 to 40 minutes a day most, most days a week can delay your onset of disability by 10 to 12 years. That's unbelievable, especially if you're 62 like I am. Sedentary living costs the nation an estimated $150 billion per year in health care costs. It is estimated that an employer can attribute 15% of all health care costs to sedentary related diseases. Now, I think this is kind of interesting. This is called the disease of I don't careitis. This is a common condition in which an individual has no interest in adopting a healthy lifestyle. I can, but I'm not going to, I won't. The symptoms can include these. All of these up here, but I especially like this one. You feel threatened when someone suggests that you could be healthier if you change the way you eat. Or you feel discouraged because you tried to make changes before, but you failed. And um, I didn't put anything up about the stages of change, but in the stages of change model, you contemplate a, something about changing a behavior, and then you think about it, you pre-contemplate, then you contemplate, then you prepare to change your behavior, and then you actually take the action to change the behavior, and then you maintain that behavior. The thing about that whole stages of change is it's cyclical. How many of you have said to yourself, oh, I'm gonna eat healthier, and you start, and you do it for six weeks, and then all of a sudden, you go back. But that's okay, you can relapse, you can get back on. So if you think that you've already made, or you feel discouraged because you tried to make changes before but you failed, that stages of change model says don't feel discouraged, just restart. If you have any of those don't care-itis symptoms, many Americans do. 83% of Americans <clears throat> last year, they didn't have a good diet, 65% were overweight or obese, and 67% of Americans didn't get enough exercise to get health benefits. So, this is the prevention message. Take action now. Our efforts to prevent disease should be like ants in the story of grasshopper and the ant. The ant prevented hunger and cold by preparing early, even though he was neither hungry nor cold at the time. So I've talked about the sense and the common sense, and common sense is not so common. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the sense, or the financial end. <clears throat> Lifestyle choices lead to chronic disease. We've, we've looked at this. This is from famous study, the Nurses' Health Study. And you can see that lifestyle, ch lifestyle choices can increase your chance for stroke, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. The, the cost of an unhealthy lifestyle, 87.5% of health care claims are due to an individual's lifestyle. In the United States, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, they account for 75% of the $2 trillion we spend on medical care. And this is just, um, a little graph to give you an explanation of lifetime medical cost of obesity. And if you look here, this dotted line, and this would be across all subsets. I just picked out one because I'm a white female. Anyway, this is the person who is of normal weight and their health care costs through their life. This is the person who is what we call um, overweight, mildly obese. And this is the person who is obese and the cost adjusted for their weight. The, city, the CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, has stated that medical costs for overweight and obesity are over $94 billion per year. And, but this is the part I like. It is estimated if physically inactive people became active we would save $77 billion per year. That is 
that's unbelievable to me. And it is estimated that each taxpayer responsible for about $180 per year for obesity-related medical costs for the public sector health plans. So we're all paying. Now, a little bit about health problems and risk factors. There are risk factors that are linked to health problems, and they're actually in two, three levels, determinants, direct contributing factors, and indirect contributing factors. For instance, we know that if heart disease, one of the determinants is that you don't exercise. But maybe a direct contributing factor to that is that what? Maybe you don't have a place to exercise. Maybe you live in an environment where it's not safe to exercise. And an indirect contributing factor is maybe there is a place to exercise, but you don't have the money. So sometimes when we look at health behavior, we don't just have to look at why this person has this behavior, but what are the direct and then the indirect contributing factors? This would be a typical company and risk factors for every 100 employees. 25 would have cardiovascular disease, 12 are asthmatic, six are diabetic, 26 have high blood pressure, 30 have high cholesterol, 38 are overweight, 21 smoke, 31 use alcohol excessively, 20 don't wear seat belts, 24 don't exercise, and 44 suffer from stress. Facts. If you have no risk factor, you're only going to cost your employer about $190 a year. If you have one risk factor, $360 a year. Two to three risk factors, $542 a year, and four to five risk factors, $718. I found this, I thought this was really pretty cute. So, <clears throat> you know, medical costs, medical medical um, inflation is up. It costs a lot. So what if food prices had risen the same rates as medical inflation since the 30s? A pound of butter would cost us $102. A pound of bananas would be $16. You go through this and you just look a pound of coffee. I really like coffee. I couldn't afford to drink coffee because it would be $64. Many companies have been put in wellness programs, and they have done the wellness programs to cut their um, insurance costs. So here are some of the big examples. Johnson & Johnson has had wellness, um, wellness in their corporations forever, wellness programs. They did a study a few years ago, and over a four-year period, they saved $38 million because of their wellness program that they put in. Another Fortune 500 company looked at putting one in. After a year, they had saved $547 per person. General Motors, they saved $500 per year per person. Travelers Corporation, this was over several year period. This was over an eight year period. They saved $146 million. DuPont, after they put in their wellness programs, lowered absenteeism by 14%. And the Union Pacific Railroad, over several years, were able to save $1.26 million on their health care costs. Consequences for employers, a thousand person firm likely spends over 400,000 annually on obesity attributable medical expenditures and absenteeism. There's another thing that we forget about, and we're talking about the cost of, of not being well. And there's a cost of presenteeism. And that's when employers at work, employees are at work, but because they're not healthy and they're not working optimally. It is estimated that annual cost to companies for the cost of presenteeism is over $180 billion a year. It's a persistent problem in 50% of workplaces. And now human resource executives are saying that it, this problem has increased significantly in the last five years as the obesity epidemic has transferred to um, obesity being a disease. These are some sobering facts.
So coming back to the sense of being physically active. This is Ponce de Leon. He wanted to find the fountain of youth. We have found the fountain of youth, but we just refuse to use it. It is being physically active. It is living a healthy lifestyle. And now I'm going to switch to wellness here at Western. Um, Dale has already talked a lot about Jackie. Uh, when I came to Western 24 or 5 years, some years ago, we tried to have a wellness committee at that point, but we didn't get anywhere. And so through the years, we kept trying to do some things. And then Jackie Thompson appeared for us. And what she said was, we're going to put Western you're going to have Western Wellness Committee. We're going to make it a multidisciplinary committee on this campus, and we're going to try and do something for our employees here at Western. So this was one of the first brochures that was put together, and it was Wellness at Western. Golly, this thing. That tells what kind of what we did, put all of it together, had our multidisciplinary team, decided what programs we were going to offer, ran some surveys, um, to get some information and needs assessment. What do people want here for um, employee wellness? And the first thing that we found out was that people wanted some type of walking initiative. And interestingly enough, walking programs are the number one programs that corporations use for wellness across the United States. So we were right in, right, we were right in step, so to speak, with all the rest of America. So we put together a program in conjunction with Human Resource, and Pam Bowman was leading that team, and it was called Western Walks. It was the first initiative, and we were doing a poll program. And through the years now, this has changed to a walkathon, and we do it every year. The first year we did this, we had over 600 participants. It was a wonderful turnout. We also were able to get signs on campuses. And many of you probably have seen these kiosks, but you probably didn't know why they were there. Well, at that time, we wanted to develop, or what Jackie's vision was, to develop walking paths across campus that anybody could walk out of the building and say, I want to take a half mile walk, I want to go for a fourth of a mile walk, and have an idea of where they were going. But the problem was, <clears throat> we didn't have any maps, we didn't have any signs. Um, so these trails were all mapped out, and exercise science students actually walked them all to make sure they were certain distances. And then we had these maps printed, and we were able to get these kiosks. The reason we were able to get the kiosks is because they just were not for employee wellness. At that point, there were new, no maps on campus. So when visitors came to campus, they didn't know where they were going. So we got these 10 kiosks to put up all over at Western Illinois University. And they were really pretty expensive. <laughs> Western wellness and employee wellness, it is part of the strategic plan, higher values and higher education. It is a core value, personal growth, which encompasses individual health, wellness, and personal responsibility. We are a core value for Western Illinois University. Employee wellness is here to stay. It's not a fad. It's something that we should all be embracing. In starting conclusion here, the most powerful thing you can do for your health is to become active. And down here by Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. So, in closing, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>